you kind of got a sense of where the justices were leaning. Obviously, Scalia made that infamous comment about a perpetuation of uh, racial entitlement. Uh, you had John Roberts. Uh, well, I want to talk about I, I want to talk on. about that perpetuation of, of racial entitlement and, and also sort of the 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 what I think is just sort of stunning. I mean, you know, we we've, we've heard ad nauseum uh, from the right wing in this country, and maybe not so much uh, as of late because they control the court now in such an explicit manner, but um, that uh, the idea of activist judges overturning. What uh, the duly elected representatives have voted for was sort of turned on its head by uh, Scalia uh, somewhere around the time that he said that racial uh, uh, perpetuation, uh, the perpetuation of uh, racial entitlement. Well, first off, he says there's something out there that uh, has been written about that I've read about, uh, you know, the perpetuation of racial entitlement. First off. When I Google it, the only uh, phrase time I can see that phrase is when he's used it in the past, uh, back in like 2007, I think, with the last version of this case, or, uh, or 2006, around the time that this was uh, reinstated uh, or uh, reauthorized. Where, 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 tell us about what that term supposedly means, at least to Scalia. I think he got it from George Wallace. Oh, nice. No, I mean, you know, you know what? I, I think in, in general, what Scalia's point was, is that it's politically radioactive for politicians to vote against the Voting Rights Act. He, he said at one point, you know, lo- even look at the name, the Voting Rights Act, who could vote against that? And he was basically saying um, that we're in a, a position where black voters have sufficient power because the Voting Rights Act, in his words, mandates black districts, which it doesn't mandate black districts unless you can logistically draw them based on the population. But nonetheless, he was basically saying that the Voting Rights Act has created a situation where black power is such that it's politically radioactive to vote against the Voting Rights Act, and thus it leads to a perpetuation of, of racial entitlement. Now, it's hard for me to even make the argument because I don't, not only do I not agree with the argument, but I don't even totally understand it. Um, but I think that's nonetheless what he was trying to argue. Now, does Justice Kennedy agree with Scalia on that? No, probably not. I mean, but does Justice Kennedy, in the end, is he prepared to sign an opinion with Scalia getting rid of the Voting Rights Act? I mean, that's all that really matters, right? I mean, the, the quote has been blown out of proportion, but the, the disturbing thing is that there's five justices on the court who basically believe that we've reached such a place where the remedies of the Voting Rights Act aren't relevant. And to say that, you basically have to think that racism and voter suppression are no longer problems in American society. And it's just very hard, based on the last election, to come to that conclusion. And, and, and just when you step back, though, the idea that you have had this, uh, this act uh, reauthorized, what is it now, five times, the idea that it was reauthorized it, with sort of overwhelming majorities in the House and the Senate becomes the fulcrum to justify overturning it. I mean, this is, you know, like the idea, uh, and, and, you know, uh, yes, I agree, we, we knew Scalia where, where he was uh, from the very beginning, but it seems to me that Kennedy is signing off on the idea that um, if, if society has agreed that this is so necessary... Uh, but uh, that their elected representatives have virtually no choice but to vote for it, even though it's unconstitutional uh, at this point. I mean, th- to to argue that this has reached that level of, I mean, there in some respects, he's like the only analogy that I could draw here is that is he's he's like almost analogizing it to to slavery, right? I mean, the idea that. This is so toxic to vote for. Now, of course, you, you could have voted against the uh, uh, authorization for war, uh, and, and that was an extremely toxic vote to take uh, You know, when we were heading to Iraq, to, to think that that could be a justification as to why the court must step in and prevent this is just, it seems bizarre to me. I mean, uh, am, I, am I reading too much into that? Well, I, I think Scalia in general has just, become very dismissive of, uh, like, any congressional legislation that was passed after, like, 1778. Um, and, and, and I think 
the question is, you know, not just the political support for the Voting Rights Act, which I think is a reason not to strike it down, simply because there clearly is a bipartisan consensus uh, for this law in Congress. Congress not just didn't just pass it once, it subsequently gone back and reauthorized it four times and held extensive hearings each time. So faced with the prospect of not renewing it, Congress has come to the conclusion that it should be renewed, not just based on the politics, but based on a very thorough evidentiary uh, record. Um, But I think it raises a, a broader question of what can Congress do? What can America do to remedy historic instances of discrimination? Throughout our history, what can we do to enforce the amendments that are in the Constitution that have often um, been ignored, principally the 15th Amendment? And if the court strikes these things down, where does it stop? I mean, they're, they're about to get rid of affirmative action, too. So you've just gotten rid of the heart and soul of the Voting Rights Act and affirmative action. So, right. I, I don't mean, know how you maintain we... affirmative action if you see, actually, uh, if you see uh, the capacity to have uh, some type of non-racially discriminatory uh, voting to be a racial entitlement. I don't see how you uphold any aspect of affirmative action. That, that's for sure. Well, I think it's it's. I think the the fate of affirmative action is even more in doubt than Section Five of the right. Voting Rights Act right. right now, based on the, the arguments before the, the court. So the court basically the question is, where are they going to stop? Are they just going to keep striking down every single law that deals with discrimination in one form or another, no matter what Congress has done, no matter what the previous amendments say? And so I think we're on a very slippery slope here. Uh, and this this decision is not just going to be a one off decision. I think it's going to embolden more radical decisions. Decision, um, by the court in the future. And I, I think so, both from a practical standpoint in terms of the importance of vote, the Voting Rights Act, but also just from a legal standpoint in terms of the power that Congress should have, uh, this decision, I think, is going to raise a lot of disturbing questions. All right. Now, I know you got to go soon. Let me just ask you one or two more questions here. Um, the uh, this whole thing about the sovereign states that um, uh, the at one point, I think, um, uh, Kennedy said something to the effect of um, uh, is a is it better off doing that uh, uh, is Alabama if Alabama wants to have monuments to the heroes of the civil rights movement if it wants to acknowledge the wrongs of its past is it better off doing that if it's an own if it's its own independent sovereign or if it's under the trusteeship of the United States government what the frick is he talking about here well it's, that was such a bizarre comment because Alabama quote unquote is under the trusteeship of the federal government, according to Kennedy, and it's passed and done monuments all over the place uh, to the civil rights movement. I mean, it's not like Alabama hasn't acknowledged its history. The problem is, as Justice Breyer said during the, the hearings, we fought a civil war. It was about states. Certain states were trying to get out of the Union so they could protect slavery. Those are the same states, it just so happens, that are still trying to suppress their growing minority vote populations today. And so, of course, this is about differences between states, because it was only some states that succeed, that seceded from the Union. I mean, so it's almost as if the Civil War had never happened in terms of these justices' understanding uh, of history. It's it's almost like the Civil Rights Movement ended in 1965 uh, with the passage of the Voting Rights Act, as opposed to continuing for nearly 50 years to have to fight on a constant basis to uphold the promise of the Voting Rights Act uh, and to get rid of voter suppression. So I think this is a very theoretical principle for people like Justice Kennedy, this idea of sort of a federalism. This is something that really happened under Rehnquist, this whole notion of a federalism revolution. And so it seemed to me like we were having a very theoretical discussion. But Ari, what is he talking about here? The uh, trusteeship. I mean, I, I'm 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 searching around here for my constitution, but it's Article. Uh, it's um, the the Fifteenth Amendment says very explicitly uh, that uh, the 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 federal government has the right to make sure that there's no discrimination that's going on in the context of voting, and um, presumably. To the extent that the rights have the states have certain rights that come in maybe the Fourteenth Amendment or uh, I think the the Tenth Amendment, um, they are the the Fifteenth Amendment. It comes after those amendments, 
I've done, uh, I've signed contracts that have been amended. You put the amendment on to supersede or trump, essentially, the amendments or the contract that ex came before it. I mean, that's the definition of an amendment, right? I mean, that's why you do an amendment. It's because we want to add this or we want to modify something that we had said earlier. And exactly. I mean, and the whole purpose of the 15th Amendment was that there was no affirmative right to vote or, and there was no protection um, based on, you know, race, color, or previous condition of servitude to vote in the United States before the passage of the, 18th, uh, the 15th Amendment in 1870. And there was no enforcement mechanism for the 15th Amendment until the passage of the Voting Rights Act. I mean, the Voting Rights Act essentially was passed to enforce something that had been passed nearly 100 years earlier. And I should just add, it's not like federal troops are occupying Alabama. I mean, all Alabama has to do is submit its voting changes to the federal government. If there's no problem, DOJ or the courts will side off on these changes, and it won't be a big deal. It doesn't cost that much money. It doesn't take that long of a time. There's only problems if they start discriminating. So it's funny, John Roberts famously said the way to stop discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Well, I could say the same thing to Alabama. You want to be free from these burdens? Well, then just stop discriminating, and you will be. But the problem is that places like Alabama are still discriminating, so they're still subject to Section 5. And I think just sort of contemplating, just even sort of like theorizing and uh, conceptually perceiving um, the idea that, well, you're making them a trustee of the year, like as if, like, you, you know, you're not, you're, you're being too in loci parentis of, of this state. It's just, it, well, this is what the Constitution says. <laughs> you know, this is not, it, it's just, it, it just seems, it, it really is stunning, their reaction. So, all right, give me one more uh, moment here. The, the blowback, okay? We know that at least uh, much of, of turnout in 2012 has been, uh, or some elements of turnout of 2012, uh, when there was a lot of concern about uh, voter ID, uh, all types of re restrictions uh, on voting, that um, there was an increase in turnout, particularly amongst um, African Americans, from where it w was anticipated, because um, the, it, it energized people that there was an attack on their voting rights. Do you think the same thing could happen here with Section 5, so much so that it will force, at the very least, um, uh, Congress to, okay, uh, you said basically threw it back to us, we're going to now make some election reforms, either in the form of, in the context of making sure that there's racial equality or just some national reforms that are well needed uh, so that you can't gerrymander the way that's been going on, you can't, you know, all lines... You, you can't have longer lines for African Americans than, uh, you know, in some districts, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I would say two things about it. Number one, I think it's a very dubious proposition to imagine that Congress can pass any sort of election reform, uh, let alone the type of election reform that would even come close to replacing Section 5. These guys can't even prevent the government uh, from running out of money or from shutting down right now. So the idea that they're going to somehow reach bipartisan agreement on election reform, I think is pretty difficult. If they're going to do it, they're certainly going to have to do it after 2014 when there's perhaps a different composition uh, of the Congress. The second thing is the blowback against voter suppression in 2012 was a very unique situation. It was the result of courts blocking a lot of these laws. It was the result of an incredibly organized presidential campaign in the Obama campaign that is not likely to be recreated anytime soon in terms of its the amount of attention they dealt to organizing. And there's the result of a tremendous organizing effort uh, in the black, Hispanic, uh, Asian, other minority groups, that is difficult to replicate. So mm -hmm. for all these reasons, I don't think we can just count on a backlash against voter suppression uh, somehow ameliorating the impact of losing Section 5. If people I talk to who are from these Section 5 states, like Texas, like Virginia, like Alabama, they say the gains that have been made in terms of things like voter registration, black candidates in office, uh, turnout, those are because of the protections of Section 5. If you get rid of Section 5, it's going to be harder for minority voters to get elected and to participate in the electoral process. And these are states where they're already, in some cases, very red. And so they're likely to get 
more red, and there's likely to be more voter suppression efforts. And it's just going to be very, very difficult to kind of create the kind of legal or grassroots mobilization that could counter uh, losing Section 5. So, I mean, it's possible some good uh, could come out of this, but I don't think we should fool ourselves. I mean, people who said, well, the Citizens United decision is going to lead to some unprecedented uh, new era of uh, campaign finance reform. Mm. Well, that hasn't happened at all. Right. And so I don't think we should think that the same thing is going to happen in voting rights either. Uh, Ari, when will we know the decision from the Supreme uh, Court? I mean, end of June, probably the last day. So uh, what will happen is that they'll issue uh, decisions probably on voting rights, affirmative action, and both gay marriage cases, and then they'll uh, go retreat uh, to the Greek Isles uh, for three months while everyone screams in fury. <laughs> Sounds like a nice gig if you can get it. Ari Berman. Of the Nation magazine, uh, thank you so much uh, for um, for staying with us longer than I know that uh, you can. I know you're very busy today, and uh, anything for you, Sam. You're very sweet, Ari. Uh, and um, next time you're in that Supreme Court, dude, when you hear Varelli not making those arguments, I think uh, my vote is you make them. You just get up <laughs> yeah, and you make them. Yelling. Think about it. All right, Ari Berman, folks.